present. Okay, are you guys all seeing the main presentation mode? Uh, no. No, okay, that's weird. Um, I just wanna say that we started recording the session. So for the records again, hello and welcome everyone. Okay, um, I don't know if it's because it's a big go, PowerPoint. If you go to display settings, mm -hmm. um, you should be able to duplicate your other screen. Oh, is it showing like you my can, notes? Um, you yeah. can try going to display okay. settings and um, switching the presenter screen with the presentation mode. Uh, okay, display settings. Um, where is that under? Uh, uh, up at the top left, it says display. Oh, okay, here we go. Thanks. Um, so okay. Is it good now? Okay, okay. Yes. great. Thanks. Okay, so thanks so much, Aubrey, for that great introduction. Um, as you mentioned, today I will be speaking with you all about research between the realms of art and science and how we as designers are constantly switching um, between the lenses that we look through to view a site or a problem more holistically and systemically. By sharing my thesis project from last year, which focuses on the Caribbean archipelago of Puerto Rico, I hope to expand our understanding of research problems to potential opportunities of change and adaptation. And just as a note, um, on the flow of my presentation, I'll probably go back and forth between talking a little bit about my project, um, but then like going behind the scenes a little to show you guys like how I kind of went about my research, with, which I think will be helpful to see. Um, so I really believe designers, landscape architects, architects have an interdisciplinary and systems-based edge over many other research fields because in any project we're dealing with culture, history, ecology, biology, physics, art, horticulture, um, et cetera. And this gives us a major opportunity to reach, collaborate with, and influence various aud audiences, including scientists, policymakers, and especially real people from the community. Um, in my MLA thesis project, The City of the Rising Sun and Moon, I was inspired by post-Hurricane Maria community solar microgrids, the resilience of the people to rebuild in their own way, and the rich ecological nightlife and night sky in Puerto Rico. Having a background in environmental policy, I began this project with a policy approach that would advance a light pollution code in Puerto Rico from 2008 by connecting it with the solar power and reforestation efforts already underway post Hurricane Maria. This slide shows my edits to the existing code, which was sent to me by a really cool marine biologist and eco tour guide in Puerto Rico, who I will speak more about later. So overall, the existing code recognized light pollution as a major issue and that the night is basically disappearing as we know it. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced beautiful, clear night skies um, in maybe more rural areas or other parts of the world, but in our modern urban world, we really don't have that anymore, um, but places that have the opportunity to preserve that are fighting for it. Um, so what this code didn't have was connecting the light pollution issue to using more renewable energy sources to provide light, um, as well as a more holistic ecological strategies such as creating um, buffer zones with vegetation to block some of that light from um, ecologically sensitive areas. And I'll go more into that later. So you may all be thinking why a light pollution code in a place that loses power so often due to hurricanes. Um, this is a satellite image from NOAA, which is a pretty good um, resource for a lot of different maps. Um, and it's showing the existing power above and then the power outage after Hurricane Maria below. So I went in this direction of light pollution because the power grid and um, fossil fuel plants in Puerto Rico are at their limits and had been crippling years before Hurricane Maria occurred. In the face of climate change, we can't just keep importing dirty fossil fuels across the ocean. And we have to rethink our relationship with energy, light and darkness 
a darker night in Puerto Rico seems inevitable if we humans don't adapt to climate change. So in reality, Puerto Rico is actually wasting energy in the form of light pollution. It is the most developed and thus heavily lit island in the Caribbean, as you can see here from these light pollution images from NOAA. This is um, from 2013. And then this is 2019. Um, so if you just go back and forth, you can really see how much brighter that got. And um, the light, which I'll also talk about it as sky glow, um, is going off into the ocean, um, which has major effects on marine life, um, which I'll go into more later. So is this really the standard we want to design back to? Would that really solve the power outage problem that we're seeing? So as I mentioned in the introduction, um, one of the first things that inspired me was the community solar microgrids. Um, when the power went out after Hurricane Maria for three months, six months, sometimes up to a year for some people, community members and organizations took matters into their own hands to install solar microgrids, which are basically um, smaller scale solar panel installations directly within the community, um, like rather than a big solar farm um, very far away, probably disturbing sensitive ecological areas. Um, so this closer connection makes it easier for many people in the community to plug into the microgrid and makes for quicker repairs after a hurricane or power outage. It also builds community, um, which is essential in a disaster prone place. So if solar microgrids do increase across the islands, like this speculated future growth map, um, is Puerto Rico going to be as bright as it was with imported fossil fuels? Um, so this is the eight existing coal, oil, and gas plants that are, as you can see, all located on the vulnerable um, coastal municipalities. And there are some large scale solar and wind um, farms. Um, but like I said, those are vulnerable as well at the large scale and the image in the corner, you can see that's going to take a lot longer to repair and connect it back to the people. Um, and then this is an overlay of hurricane paths in 1766 on top of the existing energy map. So as you can see, this is an extremely complex and even daunting issue. Um, but I think we as designers can handle these complex issues if we're a little less concerned with coming up with the perfect evidence-based solution, um, but really try to think about these issues more systemically um, and look at many different disciplines. So after looking at the island as a whole, I zoomed into the Northeast region of Puerto Rico, which is home to rich ecosystems like El Yunque Rainforest, Las Cabezas Nature Reserve, which consists of seven ecosystems in only a few miles, and a bioluminescent bay. I don't know if you can see my arrow. So that's the bioluminescent bay. And um, this is like the more zoomed in area that I was looking at, which I'll go into soon. Um, and then underlaid, you'll see the ecological communities um, with the existing light conditions on top. So my proposal considered reducing potential light pollution in ecologically sensitive areas that could economically benefit from ecotourism based on white night sky efforts that are very popular in desert regions like Colorado or Nevada, um, but environmental groups in Puerto Rico, uh, like the ones I worked with, had similar visions for this area, um, especially due to the bioluminescent bay that is greatly affected by light pollution. So you'll see red, white, and blue light, um, and this was like, the key part of my research that I critique later on, um, but it's based on research that certain species are much less affected by different light spectrums. So 
it was kind of concluded that marine species are less affected by red light. So that's why these like coastal or um, saltwater um, wetlands are getting the red light, but then more inland species were shown to actually be more affected by red light. So they would need blue light or reduced light overall. So um, as designers, when we're researching at the um, large scale, we map, we use all the McCargian layers um, and that's really useful. Um, GI we now have GIS and Photoshop to make those maps look even sharper. And that's a really great tool we have. Um, we also do our site analysis. We take lots of photos um, and sometimes we're like, great, we're all set. We did all the site analysis, um, so we're ready to design. But um, that's not always the case, and we usually have to go a little deeper. So as I alluded to before, there's this nonlinear fluidity in design, which if you're professors or anything like mine, um, this was really emphasized over and over again, but it didn't really click until I had um, some time to reflect, um, and that was definitely very difficult in the busyness of school. But what I began to notice was when I actually let myself get out of the research and design or make something with my hands or even do something non-school related, um, my mind was able to turn off, but actually not just turn off, but go like thinking about something else, but still making connections back to my research. Um, and I think that's really important to be able to like constantly switch between these realms. So um, the main part of this graphic, the web of non-human nightlife experiences was based on um, this really big messy matrix or spreadsheet of how animals evolved with the phases of the moon and thus how they're affected by artificial light. Um, so for example, turtle hatchlings naturally move towards the reflection of the moonlight on the ocean to make their way to the sea. However, with beachside development, studies have shown that they are attracted to artificial light opposite the ocean direction. So sadly, they'll go in the wrong direction and never make it out to sea. But they seem to be less affected by red light um, and specifically reduced red light that has like an intensive vegetation um, barrier. And that's what these sections are showing, which was a study based in Florida. Um, so if you can see it, like it's a little zoomed out, but when they're, this is like the basic scenario we see on a lot of beachfronts and what I was seeing on the site I was looking at, just the tall white light, street lights, um, and very little vegetation, like on a tropical beach, just the skinny palm tree, um, because that's like culturally what we like and what has been designed for. Um, but that's not what turtles and many other animals like. So, um, this was the best scenario in that study, which was replacing the street lights with red lights and then having some sort of richer um, vegetation buffer so that the turtles will see the moon reflection on the ocean instead of what's going on back here. So for a while I was stuck in that spreadsheet I showed you researching every species and how they were affected by the light. But eventually my professor told me that I needed to get out of that spreadsheet and make something. So that's when I went to these um, little shoebox hand models, which um, I don't know if you guys had ever done this, like in elementary <laughs> science class, um, when you get a shoebox, open it up, like put whatever you wanna see in it, then cut a hole, 
in the side. So when you close the shoe box and look through and put like light over it or whatever else you were trying to do, you're like kind of peering into this different world. And that's what I was trying to get to um, with this um, exercise. And it's kind of, it's like maybe a tiny bit scientific, <laughs> but really more crafty and artsy at the end. And I think since designers, um, we can be very good with our hands. So that's actually um, gives us an edge over some other types of research fields. But something I think that we can learn from other discipline, disciplines, um, like investigative anthropology or journalism, and perhaps the single most important adaptation for the design field is connecting and engaging the community. Um, the people who live and know the place so intimately um, and the places we're called to research and design in, this is where I think we can actually learn the most about a place. And what really helped me get out of those maps and scientific spreadsheets. Designing with the community is what brings life and spirit back to our mission as designers. So um, I actually went to Puerto Rico as like my research site visit the weekend before the COVID shutdown there. And I had all these plans to meet um, people working on solar, abandoned buildings, do all the site visits in the nature preserves and the bioluminescent bay, but all of that obviously went down the drain um, and I was stuck quarantining in an Airbnb that was in an amazing location and was overlooking the Caribbean Sea. Um, and I actually kind of got a taste of what it's like to be in Puerto Rico in troubled times. Um, and what I realized was that these people are so accustomed to disaster um, and compared to what I was hearing from family and friends in New York about the panic that was going on here and the lines at the supermarket, hoarding um, toilet paper, et cetera. Um, but there, it just seemed like people, you know, we're used to, okay, we're gonna go to the supermarket, but just get what we need. We're not gonna hoard, we're not gonna panic. So it was really interesting to see that. And I think this um, slogan, yo no me quito, that kind of, came out of um, post came Maria, which um, is basically um, saying like, I won't leave, I won't give up, um, I won't throw in the towel and I'll just embrace Puerto Rico and everything that's positive and wonderful about it. Um, and like it says here, not to return to where we were, but become what we hope for. So that really clicked for me while I was there. And um, when I was stuck in that Airbnb, like I could still look out at the ocean and see from the 11th floor turtles swimming in the ocean. And I realized that there's problems here, but there's also problems in the whole world. And um, there's also so much life, beauty, and opportunity for Puerto Ricans to be proud of and to share with the world. Um, so that's really the direction that my project went in after, um, my sort of unsuccessful yet successful site visit. Um, so one of the people I was able to connect with over Zoom over the remainder of my semester was Leonor, who is a marine biologist and tour guide from the, um, non-governmental organization Para la Naturaleza. Um, and of course, I had done my own research and knew about the bioluminescent bay um, and all that good stuff, but she shared with me so much more and she told me about the bioluminescent behavior. Um, so the plankton, which is a species called Peridinium bahamensi, um, they have this behavior that they'll go to the bottom of the lagoon um, during a full moon because they're kind of like scared, I don't know, scared or just like they don't like the light. And then in a new moon, when the it's darker and the sky is clear, um, they rise to the top of the lagoon. And that's when tour guides bring people out on kayaks to see 
the magical glowing water, um, which when you touch it or put your kayak um, or through um, the water lights up. So she knows, Leonor knows like this place very intimately because she's a tour guide there. So it was really great to hear her perspective on it. Um, but sky glow and the light pollution is getting in the way and um, hurting this tour because um, the artificial light from um, increasing urbanization and development is acting as the full moon, even in the new moon and the um, bioluminescent plankton are falling to the bottom of the lagoon and staying there. Um, so I asked Leonor what would help her organization, the people in the community and the ecology in the area the most. And she said, maybe a sort of night trail um, that they can use like as a backup to when the bioluminescent bay isn't glowing um, and to keep tourists interested, but also to teach people um, that light at night isn't always a good thing, especially in sensitive ecosystems, and also to advance the light pollution code, which she was a part of, and to rebuild people's relationships with the night and the night sky, and perhaps bring back that magical glow of the bioluminescent bay. So this connection really helped shape my project. I was able to go deeper into the ecological communities because I connected with the human community too. But really they're just one interconnected um, system. And that was something that I've been learning over time that we always speak of like nature and humans as separate, but we really need to start thinking and talking about them as one system. Um, so also from learning about the recent reforestation efforts across the island from Leonor, I paired those efforts with reforestation buffer zones um, that use plant species that are endemic to Puerto Rico, um, help build the, the dunes, stabilize um, them so that they're better storm surge buffers, choosing hurricane tolerant species and also culturally significant species as these buffer zones that help protect the light from seeping into sensitive ecosystem. So with that, I encourage you all to find your Leonor in a project. And it's great that you guys mentioned that you have some like funding or scholarship to do research, which my school didn't really, and we would have to do like an internship for credit, but it would be amazing to be able to do like your own research outside of school and get credit for that. Um, or if you don't have time for all of that, just connecting with more people in the community. And that's so easy now with Zoom, like we're doing today, you could, literally connect with anyone in the world and just have a quick Zoom meeting. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to touch on the limits of science. And I think we as designers need to be constantly questioning um, because that's kind of what we do. Like we're constantly probing and asking questions in order to get to our next design phase. So this was one part of my research that I was having a lot of back and forth with um, because the science just isn't there yet um, with understanding how like every single species is affected by the light and different light spectrums. And I was trying to make it clear cut, like, oh, the marine animals are um, less affected by red light. So red light there and then inland species, just less light or blue light, but it really wasn't that clear cut and I was like reading every species and I was like, oh, well, sometimes they like purple light or orange light. And I was like, this is just gonna be like a mess of different colors. So um, that's kind of when I like just backed off and um, 
like it would be interesting if I could work with like a biologist who really studies that, but I don't know if like we as humans can actually know like every little thing about um, ecology and other species and how they really experience the world. Um, so this is the, these are the plans that, you know, I was finished on, but I don't think I would feel comfortable really recommending this to um, like a whole region at this scale. And I think that's something that we really need to be reflective and cautious about um, and really taking a step back as designers and knowing our limits. Um, because sometimes, you know, we want to design and solve everything, but sometimes we just, you know, need to take a little more time. Um, but that's not to say don't design anything. Um, but I think just taking the pieces that make the most sense and help communities the most. So for me, that was rebuilding the human and non human relationships, um, the vegetated buffer zones and the night trails and all of the experiences and opportunities that bring life and spirit back to the degraded, ignored, exploited, colonized, erased, polluted, abandoned and poorly designed places. So yes, it's great to use science as a tool, but in the end, what is our real mission as designers? I think science can give us structure and logic to our research and it helps us confirm things we may or may not know. It assists in quicker decision-making, but it can also help us miss a lot and blindside us. In design, perhaps quicker decision-making and design implementation is not actually what we need, but actually time and patience to really get to know a place and what brings life back to it. Science does not always bring life and spirit back to a place. So I started this presentation with a lot of problems, hurricanes, imported fossil fuels, blackouts, light pollution. Um, but perhaps instead of trying to solve every problem in our research, we should try to find the opportunities and the magic in it. So thank you, that is all I have prepared. I hope that wasn't too short, um, but I'm open to any questions and discussions. Thanks. Thank you, Annette, Ellie. That was a very interesting project, um, something innovative and something that I think a lot of communities have a uh, light like pollution right now. So that was interesting. Thanks for that. Um, okay, we have a question in the chat and Aubrey is asking, how do people react to the replacement of the lights that you were talking about? Um, how did people react? Yeah, or so would they? That was in the context oh, okay. of like the, the red light to blue yeah. light uh, to white light. So. Okay. Oh, uh, well, let me back up a little. So I forgot to mention that the red light um, is actually already implemented in some beaches and coastal towns in Puerto Rico. So you can see it here. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting yeah. to see that when I visited. Um, and I wish I could have been there or not been in like quarantine to like be out there longer and like talk to people and ask them what they thought about this. Um, but yeah, that would be hard. <laughs> um, but it seems like they went ahead and implemented it um, in some areas and people who live there are, you know, they're accepting it and I, I think people who are like working in tourism or um, ecotourism or environmental areas, they probably appreciate it. Um, but perhaps others who aren't as environmentally literate or uh, aren't as accepting to change would kind of view this as like a 
weird like alien world <laughs> um but i think it's really just trying to like understand how other species see the world and design for them as well as humans definitely thank you um, so you did do the research for the animals to see like what light impacts which animal. I was wondering if uh, you looked into their food network, for example, if the red light would impact the food network for the turtle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a little bit. Um, for example, I think I had it here, like these represent different biological processes. So um like if they're if they were eating fish or plankton that were also affected by light in different ways then that would um in turn affect the larger animal um there was something interesting about species um yeah i think like a lot of marine animals that since they're more affected by blue light which is closer to the white light that's we have, um, they, it's basically like mimicking the full moon and a lot of animals um, that are prey or predators um, become more active during the full moon. So it's like, a, if it's like a constant full moon for them, they're constantly gonna be like hunting and eating other animals. So it's not the best. Yeah, I think this project was amazing because it's so scientific heavy. Um, I think the way we design right now in school, we do the research, but not as deeply as this project. So this shows how to show scientific data in a graphical manner, or like how to best yeah connect the design and research as was the goal for this lecture. So great job. Okay, if Thanks. anyone else has any questions, please unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Ali has a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Natalie. Thank you for the great uh, session that we had. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, how difficult you find it to convince the people in industry that this is important for us as designers to include science and research in our work because I see them that they are like, you are designers, you are not going to use this and this and this in your work. But mm -hmm. uh, as someone is now outside of the academia, how difficult mm -hmm. did you find it? Yeah, it's definitely still um, a challenge like, um, uh, for example, I'm working on a reforestation project now um, for um, a New York City um, reservoir and um, the, I guess, like the government officials that we're working for are kind of like when we're <laughs> more, when we really want to push specific species because these are the species that are going to benefit the area. We're kind of like oh whatever like something will grow there like we don't have to really like take that much time so it's definitely still a challenge even in the professional world um but i think what would help um is working with um other disciplines like getting like the science expert or like the ecologist or the marine biologist and getting them on our team um because then you know, that definitely gives us more traction and um, and really just like collaborating with as many different disciplines as possible so that it's like, oh, it's not just this design or this one like, I don't know, narrow thing. It's like all of us agree and we're all, we all have a niche um, in the project and are like an expert in our own ways. And then when you have like that group or even like getting the community involved, um, then someone we're trying to like industry or developers that are probably have more money and are more powerful than us. But when we start to get all these collaborators, then we 
become more powerful as well. And uh, following that, uh, to what extent do you think that we need to be familiar with the other disciplines to be able to work in such groups? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's also um, pretty helpful. Um, I guess for me, I kind of have always been interested in uh, like kind of like, I don't know, kind of like nerdy, like it's like the biology and ecology. Um, so that helped me. Um, and just like, I think like for a lot of designers, it might be difficult to read um, scientific papers, but um, like for me, it helped to just like learn how to skim them and I used to like read try to read like the whole thing and that's just like crazy and a waste of time but like I don't know I guess one tip is just like going to those scientific papers and like just skipping to or reading the abstract and then skipping to the conclusion and then that's like a quick way to do research um, for something that you might not be as familiar with and then yeah, or looking for like the kids version of the science, which can be really helpful. Yeah, thank you, great. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you so much, Natalie, for the lecture. It was great. Thank you. Um, and I want to remind to everyone that we're going to have our next session on April 15th uh, with Mahiar Hadiri, and he's going to talk about academic jobs after graduation. So please join if you can. And thank you everyone for joining today. It was a pleasure having you all here. Thank you. Great to meet all of you. Yeah, it was great to meet you too. And um, I just wanted to say the whole presentation was very well put together and just very informative. So thank you for that. Okay, no problem. It was really amazing. Thanks a lot, Natalie. Thank you.